What's up, you guys? We are back. Sales Bro Pod. I think this is episode 19 with Mr. Wyatt Beamer. Wyatt, thanks for coming on, man. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. Yeah, so this is going to be a cool episode for the audience because I think you're the first guy on the podcast who, like, you didn't really start as a sales guy. It was kind of just like the natural progression of you know, things that you had to do to have success where you wanted to. Mm-hmm. Um, so for context for the viewers, would you mind kind of telling people like what you're up to right now? Yeah, hundred percent. So right now, um, I own and run and found the Legion agency. Um, it's around 30 K a month kind of fluctuates because we run on commission, but right now I'm running that, been running that since, um, late August or early August of last year. So not even a year, um, but coming up on a year <clears throat> and I'm also a consultant, in Agency Velocity, a community where we help people start and scale their lead generation lead generation agencies to 10K a month. So been doing that since uh, February. So yeah, that's been awesome too. Been, you know, just helping people do it. And it's, it's a whole other ball, ball game. And Dylan, you're familiar with that because you have your community. And yeah, so it's, yeah. it's been fun. It's been fun. Yeah. Sweet, man. Yeah. And for anybody listening who doesn't know me or doesn't know why, because I'm sure like when, when your audience sees this, like they're probably not going to be as much on like sales side of things. Right. Um, Wyatt and I first connected back in like summer of last year when like both of us were in really, really different spots than where we are now. Um, (laughs) And the way that I know Wyatt is he actually built my community landing page, which I still have today. It's, it's a little bit upgraded, but the, the core yeah. pieces are still there. And um, Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this was before, you know, the lead gen thing was even, I don't know, maybe it was in the picture. Maybe you were working on it. But Yeah, I think it was, uh, I was like just getting out of it. Um, and you're like, you're the last landing page I built, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, cool. And you yeah. gave me a, a sweet deal. It was no brainer. So, yeah, it's still running, still good. And then. Just being able to stay connected with uh with you yourself like it's it's been cool and then also we've done some like a little bit of back and forth referrals stuff like that i've definitely sent people your way so yeah for the viewers um it it is cool to see like hey a year ago we were kind of both in like different places and we just stuck to it and now we're you know i would say we're both doing pretty well um 100 percent but let's let's take it back like let's start um, let's start uh i don't know how far back do we go like we can, when did we can you... go to like the beginning we can go like to the beginning i haven't I haven't been in the game too long yeah when did you realize like online business was was the path for you so that's a good question so i mean all throughout um high school never wanted to go to college school was never for me um, eventually graduated high school. I applied to two colleges and filled out like one scholarship, right? My grades weren't like good enough to like really get a, like a fe- like a really good scholarship. So it wasn't for me. So I took a couple of gap years. Um, and I knew I wanted to start something on my own, but I kind of just waited for the time to come. I kind of, I didn't really search out for it or do research, which I think I should have done, but I think I was just lazy for, so for about like two years, I was just working. I worked in construction. I worked in warehouses. I worked at like daycares. I had like probably five different jobs between that two years. I worked at a retirement home and I just knew like this nine to five and having, having my own, like having a boss tell me what to do. And just, it wasn't for me. I'm the type of person where I don't, if a boss isn't good, I don't respect you. (laughs) And when I don't respect you, I'm like, not even going to like pay attention to you. And I'm going to disrespect, disrespect you. Like, and you know, I did my best, but I just knew it wasn't for me. I knew I wanted to create my own thing, have my own thing. So yeah, so I moved, I moved out of my parents' house in 2022, January, excuse me. And then I moved in with a, a few buddies of mine and one of the guys there was actually kind of in the online business space. Um, 
and he's actually like he showed me receipts of like stuff he's done and stuff he's already been doing so i'm like man like maybe i was like okay i think this is the opportunity i have like i've been waiting for it for like a few years and i'm like man i'm gonna i'm gonna go for it right um so i went for it and in about about a year like a little bit over a year from that conversation happened um here we are so yeah yeah what was your buddy doing so he was he was a ghostwriter. Um, he was ghostwriting for a few people on Twitter, and I wasn't. I was really overthinking like what to do, because um, I was like, I don't want to be a ghostwriter because I'm a terrible writer. Um, and then also, there's like a bunch of options. And then I actually, yeah, like you said, like you mentioned before, I landed on web design because I'm kind of like back in the day, I would say I was a big artist, like I draw a lot. So I was like, okay, design and like copy, like I can like learn it. So that's what I landed on after like deciding between like 10 services. And I looked into yeah. sales too, but it didn't really, yeah. I don't like talk. Personally, I actually don't like really talking to people, but <laughs> got to do what you got to yeah. do now. Me, I mean, it's maybe not expected, but me, me neither. Like I'm not a natural salesperson. Right. You know, I, everything I know, like I had to make a, a real effort to learn and implement which i think a lot of people come they see like what sales can do and or like being what being good at sales can do for them and then they're like you know what man let me put my my like introvert introvertedness aside and just like make some money that that's what i did yeah. literally yeah no um, i think that's like a lot of people doubt themselves. Like when people want to get into sales, people doubt themselves because like, okay, I don't like talking to people. I don't like people. I'm introverted. I want to just stay in the back and do my own thing. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to do this, do that. But in reality, like those people have probably like, <laughs> will probably do the best. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause like it's, I feel like it's similar to like, and I guess this is with any skill. It's like when you're working out, like you bulk to cut, but if you just like, I mean, you could like lean bulk, but it just takes way longer. And if you like, right. if you just consume all this stuff um, in an attempt to learn and then you cut back what doesn't work, like starting from zero, like, I think, I don't know. It's just, it's just more effective in my opinion. Yep. Yep. 100%. So, 100%. Why, why did you ultimately decide that, um, that web design was like not the thing for you? That's a really good question. So I was doing my own outreach, building the personal brand on Twitter, you know, tips and tricks about landing pages, <clears throat> doing outreach, seeing people, seeing if people wanted landing pages. I did that for about a few months. And although my personal brand was doing okay, like no one really wanted or needed a landing page right? It's very timing based. Like with you, you came to me because you needed one, right? Um, and you knew me and you knew I like did the web design stuff. So it's, it base it's like off of referrals and just timing. And so when doing my own outreach, I like, I think I got like a one yes out of probably the 500 messages I've sent on Twitter. And obviously 500 is not a lot, but like the young stupid me was like, you know what, this, I, this clearly doesn't work. Um, so, but I switched it up, but yeah, I mean, I wanted big projects. I wanted something I could live off of and doing landing pages for two, 500 bucks. I was like, mm, I'm not a fan of that. <laughs> um, I want people to pay me thousands. Right. So I'm like, what can I offer? What can I offer to people that will, they will pay me thousands of dollars, which I yeah. eventually landed on lead gen. Yeah. How uh, how big of a part in you getting to where you are today would you attribute um, like Twitter to? I would say a lot. Um, most of my clients didn't come. Well, the web design clients mostly came from Twitter. They all came from Twitter. Um, but the, all my lead gen clients, my lead gen, like my lead gen clients, they didn't come from Twitter. But I would say it played a pretty big role just because of all the good information that was on the, this on the um, social media site like 
so many people were just bringing out so much value and like, right, they're doing it to build a personal brand, but it's real value. Like I was looking at everything, sales, lead gen, marketing, copywriting, anything you could, web design, whatever it may be. And also I wouldn't be in the position I am with agency velocity um, because I had a connection through Levy. I met Levy on Twitter. So if Twitter was never a thing, I wouldn't be in the position where I was at, right? Um, yeah. So no, Twitter's been super, super huge. I, I'm not the biggest fan of the platform, but if you want to build a personal brand and network with and get some opportunities and get some customers, definitely the place to be. Yeah. Yeah. I, it was, it was huge for me as well. Just like meeting the people that you meet. Like I'm a, I'm a coach on, you know, on a couple of teams, like agency growth things. And like, I, I wouldn't have had that without Twitter. And obviously, right. you know, just like agency velocity, I mean, different structure, but I mean, primary traffic source, Twitter for, for what Twitter. you're doing, what I'm doing, not for your agency, but for like the coaching. So right. it's been huge, been huge there. Yeah, it's been lots of opportunities came from Twitter, hundred percent. Yeah. So when you, when you like stumbled across Legion and you're like, oh, this is the thing that's going to get people to pay thousands of dollars for me, like for the work that I do for them. Was it like uh, a recommendation from like a homie or was it you were just on Twitter and you found like some giveaway or what was it? Yeah, uh, I think, so I kind of came to a decision. I'm like, man, you know what? Web design isn't for me. And I didn't want to ask my buddy for advice just because I was like, you know what? I want to do my own research to see what I would like and see what, you know, will essentially give me the most money, right? Um, so I think just, I found it out, found out about lead generation just scrolling through Twitter, honestly, and looking up a bunch of different industries and a bunch of different services that people were uh, specializing in. Um, and studying it, I realized that lead generation is like one of those <clears throat> industries. It's like, it's there's always going to be a need, no matter what, right? Like web design was like, there's no need unless there's a need, but with lead generation, there's always a need hundred percent of the time. And it will be like that for a long, long time. Right. Yep. So I was like, okay, it's something that the market will always need. And it, people are willing to pay people thousands of dollars. Cause I also saw screenshots of Twitter, you know, like lead generation agencies making like 50 G's a month. And I'm like, what are they? I'm like, what? I'm like, how's that? I'm like, if they can do it, I can do it too. Right. So mm -hmm. I think that was the thought process behind it. Yeah. So you, how did you, how did you land your first client? Was it, was it a cold email? Like, what did that look like? Yeah. First lead generation client. So this was, it was super interesting. So it's actually labeled like a, uh, um, I forgot what I was labeled. I think like appointment center or like whatever, like it was my first client. Like I did cold email for them. I set up all the systems, but the pay and the structure was kind of weird. Um, but yeah, it was a TikTok marketing agency. Um, I ran some cold emails for them. It was like, I think it was like 50 bucks a call and then like commission on the back end. Um, so I did not get a lot of money from that. I didn't, well, first I didn't book them a lot of meetings, right? I didn't give them a good, a good service. Um, but I could see that it was something that he needed and really wanted and something that I could crack. Um, something I could figure out, something I could write with the right strategy. Um, but yeah, don't have that client anymore, but it was a really good learning experience. So, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think you've kind of found your, your niche now. Um, I don't believe yeah. you're working with TikTok agencies anymore. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> What, what was it like going from like first client to first few to really finding like your, your place in the market? Like, right. What were some of the biggest, you know, lessons or challenges that you were facing? Yeah. So I think with the TikTok marketing, so I, the, my first two clients were TikTok marketing agencies and I realized that number one, it, it's saturated. Although you can crack saturated markets, I was a beginner. I was like three, four months into this. And I was like, you know what, man, I don't have the experience for this. <laughs> um, so I was like, you know what? Um, I'm going to drop them. Like I'm going to switch to a different, <clears throat> different niche. Um, and for those of you who don't know, I was, I was once a student in agency velocity. 
So I joined Agency Velocity in uh, August of 2022. And from there, we sat, I sat down with Levy and we chose a brand new niche. We chose IT slash tech. So pretty, pretty broad, right? That's a lot of companies. That's software development, management, cybersecurity, um, what else? SaaS could be a part of that, right? So it was a pretty broad niche. Um, so I started super broad with my niche and then got in as many clients from that niche as I could. Well, not as many as I could, because I got, I got, I got six or seven from that, like from that, from those campaigns. Um, and I don't remember the exact number, but six or seven. Um, so yeah. And then I started doing outreach for all of them. And essentially I, I did really well for some of them and I did really bad for some of them. And the ones I did bad for, I cut off and refunded. And the ones I did good for, I put all my focus and energy into them and their campaigns and their success. And it all went from, you know, blew up from there, just putting all my time, yeah. money and effort into clients I've been doing good for and actually get results for leads to you getting more money. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, right now, are you kind of like working only within one niche or do you still have clients from like other niches that you were doing well for? Yeah, right now. So right now I'm in one niche. Um, I prefer not to say it, Dylan, if that's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got you. Um, yeah, yeah. So right now I'm servicing one niche, but right now I'm not too focused on taking on any more clients um, right now. But yeah, focus on one niche. Um, and if anybody wants to come to me with, you know, if they want help some with lead generation, I'm always happy to help, but comes with a price, of course. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and you found so. What were you like <clears throat> when looking for that niche? Because I, I imagine a lot of, you know, just like agency owners or aspiring agency owners are going to be listening. Like, what were some of the biggest things you were looking for in that, like, the the niche that, you know you thought would be successful. Yeah, hundred percent. So, I mean, I think for all agency owners, it's like, I want to find that blue ocean niche, right? That niche that is easy, gets me a lot of money and is untapped. Like those are, I think those are like the three pillars, right? That like you're looking for in a niche. Um, so, will I say that's the best strategy and the best way to go about it? No, but if you're looking for that, I mean, exactly what I did, right? Start broad dive into a very broad niche. So like marketing is very broad, right? You have TikTok, yeah. Facebook, Google, right? Those, that's super broad. Take on as many clients um, as you can from that niche. And like I said, do your best for all of them. Like how many clients? Let's say you have 10 clients. Do your best for all 10. And then the ones you do bad for, cut them off, refund them, do whatever you need to do. And the ones you're doing good for, you keep those, right? And then that turns into your sub niche. So let's say I had a Google ads agency and a TikTok marketing agency. I took them both on and say I crushed it for Google ads, right? So it's like, okay, TikTok didn't go too well. I'm not, right, we didn't book a lot of meetings. Okay, refund, drop them, whatever it means, hand them off to someone else and then put your full focus into Google ads, right? Go into Google ads, do even better than what you're doing before, build out a case study, record a new VSL, boom. Now you've got your new sub niche, so instead of your niche, your old niche being marketing, now it's Google ads. And then you just kind of keep doing that, right? Because Google ads is also a little broad, okay? Because now you have Google ads for e-com, Google ads for restaurants, whatever it may be. So you can just keep going until you find like that perfect sub niche that you're killing it for, right? So I think that's how yeah. you could find that market that you're really looking for. Yeah. A lot of beginners are probably in the spot where it's like maybe they had a little bit of success or they got a little traction. And then it all fell apart and now they're in the spot where it's like, all right, time to do it again, which, you know, I know both of us have probably experienced at one point in time. Um, how many, yeah. like, let's call it iterations. Like how many times did you have to tweak your offer to tweak your market, like change what you're doing before you could get to a spot where you're like, yeah. Yeah, this, this one is it. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think I'm always, I'm continuously changing my offer um changing like not i wouldn't say niches i stick with a niche obviously but like you know switching the market like the offer like i'm continuously doing that just because i have to adapt to the market right so yeah. every time i built a case study like I, I got a case study i built out a new uh landing page or uh vsl whatever it may be right i um what's it called i lost my train of thought 
Um, or say the question again. Like I was just wondering, like the iteration process. Oh, like right. Okay. 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 Like so how many times before you? How many leave? times? I say every few months. I did. I mean, because we had TikTok, right? So my landing page was like, okay, we help TikTok agencies, um, like get more clients. So it's like, okay, I dropped my TikTok. Now I'm focusing on IT. Okay. Now I'm like, hey, I help I, IT companies do this, this, and that. Okay. Then we dial that dial down even more. I did good for software development. So I was like, okay, now I help software development companies get this amount of money. So it was ever like ever so just continuously changing. Um, and I was just, a, <clears throat> excuse me, I was just adapting to essentially how the market was reacting to like me and my service. So I was like, okay, I killed it for software development. I'm going to build out a software development case study. I'm going to put that in a VSL. I'm going to put it on my landing page. I'm going to put that in my, my email, my emails, right? To software development. Like, hey, we helped a software development company do this, 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 and that. So I'd say con continuously changing. Um, but yeah, I'd say every few months is a good time to kind of look at your offer and your niche and like what you're doing and just kind of analyze some things and see if you need to tweak anything, change anything. So, yeah. 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 I think, I think that's a lot of people or a lot of people that are newer aren't really expecting that and they probably should be like it. Right. Chances of you getting it right on attempt number one, like while it can't happen, it's very, very that's slim. Not very, very slim. Correct. So I want to, I want to talk a little bit more about sales. Um, and don't worry, we're not gonna, we're not going to drill objections or anything. But <laughs> you you said earlier in the call, like you know, you're not really like the guy who's going to go and you're not like the golden retriever. Like you're not going to go and like strike up conversations. Like you're more kind of to yourself, similar to me. Mm -hmm. um, what's I mean, going from the early days of like first clients to now, like you know, really gaining some traction and having, having the team and stuff. Like what are some of your biggest sales takeaways so far? Yeah. So, so a little background on like my sales. So obviously, like we said before, no experience whatsoever in sales before I got in the game. Um, and yeah, so when I first started my IT niche, like my, that campaign, I got a lot of discovery calls. So I'm like, at the time I was like 20 years old, 19, however old I was, I think I was, yeah, I was 19, wait, 19 or 20, doesn't matter. Um, yeah, I'm hopping on these calls, you know, with these like million dollar companies, I don't know what I'm doing, right? So I'm just going through like a structure, blah, blah, blah. And I, my first 10 calls, I closed five, right? No sales experience, like didn't, didn't know what I was doing. I'm talking to million dollar companies, I'm sitting in. I'm sitting in basically a dorm room on Zoom calls, right? So I'm like, man, like I had to think, like a few months go by, I have these clients and clients are coming to me and I'm closing. And I'm like, man, I'm had to think, I'm like, why, why is there so much success? I'm like, why is that, like, why is this kind of like easy for me, right? Like, so I'm like, man, like if you have a no brainer offer, sales is very, very easy, very, very easy. A very no brainer and a proven offer, right? So my offer is like, hey, we'll get you these leads you have to pay per call. And if we don't hit this criteria, I'll pay you back. And we've done it for this, 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 and that company, right? And they're like, okay, like it's hard for them to say no to that, right? Because because yeah. every, every, uh, every company needs lead generation, right? And that's also another key factor is like how, how like whatever you're selling, how much does the market want, right? Like if you were to sell for software development, that'd be a little tricky. They're bigger deals. It's very timing based. Um, it's not a really a need to the market, right? It's just a, something nice to have. So I think my biggest takeaway is definitely having, when you're selling something, having a no brainer offer, a proven offer and sales really becomes easy because I had no idea what I was doing. Like Dylan said, I don't know how to handle objections. I would just say the first thing that come, came to my mind in the call, right? Um, so yeah, I think that was my, one of my biggest takeaways, hundred percent. Yeah. And as someone who's, you know, primarily in sales and I've sold a bunch of different things, like, dude, there's been times where I'm, you know, closing on one team and I'm closing like over 40% and I'm like, dude, I'm the fucking, I'm the man, like I'm the right. top sales, rep, all that. And then maybe I go sell something else and it's like, 
the whole team, including myself, is below like ten percent. We're at like five percent, which is not good right. at all. Doesn't that and doesn't add like, up? That doesn't add up. Yeah. So it's like it, it truly is about the offer. Right now, I'm in a good spot where um, you know I'm still a sales rep for a company, and uh, I, I have my own offers. And luckily, the offers on on my end and the team's end are like they're very good and they're very easy to sell. Um, what? How do you? I guess when you restructure your offer, you decide, hey, let me let me try this for a little bit. Let me reach out to these people. Like, have there been times? And I mean, not. I know there have been times, but like, can you kind of talk on the times where you realize that the offer wasn't good enough? Like, were you were you having like quote unquote sales slumps or like how how do you know? that the offer is really resonating with your market besides people calling Right, you. that's a good question. That's a good question. I think it comes with testing, honestly, like because – so my brother at the time when I was selling my lead generation services and I had like a 50% close rate, he was, a, uh, he was selling solar, right? And he would close around like 2025, which is like pretty good, right? But he came to me and I told him this. I'm like, yeah, man, like I had 10 calls. I closed five of them. Like it was, it was pretty easy. And he was like, he was like, what? He's like, how is that even like possible? Like you, you don't have any experience in sales, like blah, blah, blah. Um, so I'm like, I, I don't know. And he, he can, he came to the conclusion as well that you have to, you have to have a no brainer offer. Like it just doesn't make sense for them to say no. So I think the biggest thing is just testing. Like if you take 10 sales calls on an offer, all 10 are qualified and you're a skilled sale, a skilled salesman and you close one out of 10, in my opinion, that's probably not a good offer. Um, what makes a good offer? I mean, I would say measurable end result in time frame with a unique mechanism and a guarantee in place, right? I think that's what makes up an offer, right? Because if you go to software yeah. development companies, most of their offers are like, we build apps and you have to pay me 250 grand. And it's like, that's not an offer, right? So that's why it's kind of harder for them to hop on calls with somewhat warm, warm prospects and close just because yeah. of that. they don't have a, a real measurable offer and defined offer. Yeah. So, yeah. What are some things that you've seen to work really well selling to, you know, larger businesses, like any tips or tricks that, you've uh you've put to use and, and had good results with yeah i mean let me think about that one it depends on the prospect i've talked to i've talked to a lot of rich companies and some of them are really cool and some of them are willing to pay um but i think honestly the biggest thing with those bigger companies is proof and case studies because I've asked, for, like, I've, I had a call with a company that was doing like 30 M's a year, right? Loads of money, right? And the reason I say it depends on the prospect, because these guys are, were very, very stingy. Like they, they told me this, like in the call, like they barely paid, they barely like spent thousands on like services. So I'm like, okay. So that's why I say it depends on the prospect. Mm -hmm. But another thing they asked me um, was like, Hey, like, do you have any proof that you've done this. And at the time I didn't have case studies for that specific industry. So I'm like, I'm like, man, I don't like, I really don't. Um, and I was like, man, I was like, and, and then he was just like, yeah, I mean, if you can't prove to me that you've done it, right. Like it's going to be hard. So I'm like, okay. So what I did was just show him that I've been booking calls for myself. Um, I booked five calls in like a week when I booked like 10 calls and like, I think 10 calls in like two days, something like that. Right. So a lot of calls. So he's like, okay, you saw, he saw that I can do it. I didn't tell him I was doing it for myself. I just showed him some campaign stats. Right. Um, and he was like, okay. And like, he paid me and he usually never pays. And he didn't even want to hop on the call if there was like a setup fee. Um, but he paid because he saw proof that I could do it. Um, and we got that client and we did pretty good for him. So it was a good, yeah. But I think that's the biggest thing. Just like proof you can do it. That comes with a good offer but also comes with a proven offer, right? So. Yeah. How did you, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe you did like, 
completely commission? Because I think you said in the beginning you were doing like pay per call or yeah. I don't know your structure, but when you didn't have results, you didn't have testimonials, like is that what you did? You kind of not worked for free, but like made it a complete no brainer. Yeah, complete no brainer. So this is what we, so this is what you, uh, I actually didn't do this, but this is what I would do differently if I had no case studies, no proof. So what I would do is do a small, I would do a small commitment fee. So like I would say 500 to a thousand, because when people don't pay you to me, red flag client, I'm not taking them on no matter how much opportunities there are there. I'm not going to take them on just because I've had experience where people don't pay setup fees. Um, and they're not committed. They don't want to win. They're not going to put any effort in. They're not going to communicate to you. So wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. So what I would do is do like a 500 to a thousand, uh, set fee just because people can afford that. There's not much to lose on their end, especially if they're rich, right? If they're broke, it might hit them a little bit, but don't work with broke clients. So, and then the rest of your setup fee. So like a set of fee in a lead generation agency is like two to three K you plug in that 1500 or 2k you have left into the like the first five to 10 calls so the first five to 10 calls would be like 500 bucks and then however much that adds up and then after that it'd be like 250 if that makes sense so mm -hmm. that's like completely no-brainer and then on top of that you place a guarantee if we don't get you this many calls slash clients then we'll refund you everything right yeah so yeah yeah. And then you so have to do everything in your power to over deliver essentially. Yeah. I've worked with a lot of lead gen guys. Like I've sold lead gen before and I've worked, like I've kind of helped a lot of people like with their offers and stuff. And lead gen is one of those where there's so many like areas you can tweak an offer. Like with a right. coaching program, it's like, let's make it more expensive or let's add this. But like with lead gen, there's right. like, Startups, There's so many variables you can do. Share, paper call, retainers. Like, yep. Yeah. Guarantees, like whether you're guaranteeing calls or revenue or pipeline, like there's so yep. many moving parts. Um, right. And this is how, this is how I know it's an offer. So closing Dylan, wait, as a salesman, does do retainer, the selling retainer, like a retainer offer, is that a little bit harder? Is selling a retainer uh, for like, like, like instead of like a paper call or like set up or like a one-time payment, like, is that a little bit more difficult? I mean, I would say, yeah, like it depends, it depends. Right. My, I'm leaning towards like, yes, because anything that's like paper performance is just an easier mm -hmm. sell. Right. It's no, it's no brainer. It's performance based. You get paid if you get results. So the, like I'm saying this because I now charge a retainer. I don't do setup fees. I don't do performance based. Well, I mean, technically I do cause I also add some commission and small paper calls, but I charge a retainer and my close rate went from 50 to 40, right? Not much of a difference. Still a really good close rate. Um, that's because I had a no brainer offer and a proven, I, showed them I've done it before, like five to 10 different times. So it comes down to a good offer and a proven offer. Right. And yeah. there wasn't a lot of objections. There wasn't a lot of objections on pricing, which surprised me. Cause I, once I changed my offer, I thought like, man, I'm going to be closing like 10, like 10, 15%, something like that. 10, 20, um, yeah. which is still not terrible, but I'm like, it's still a lower, but it didn't change much. So that's when I was right. like, oh man, like this, this just has to be like, I'm showing them I've done it a million times and I can do it for them too. So, yeah, it's, it's like the perceived value. Like you can double the price of something and people will still buy it because I mean, if it's more expensive, they see it as more of like a luxury and they're like, oh shoot, this is exclusive. Like I want that, you know? Right. And exactly. obviously you have the results. What's uh at this point, I'm sure you've had some referrals maybe some inbound leads. Um, mm -hmm. What's the difference in closing like an outbound lead that you sourced via cold email versus like, Hey, my buddy with this business wants to talk to you. Oh yeah. That's a good question. So I actually have had a client like that before. 
So people on email or people through outbound or whatever way you're doing outbound, they're definitely a little bit warmer just because like they've showed interest. Like it's kind of like, I don't know. It's like you reach out to them cold and now they're warm. Like you turn them warm. Right. So I'd say, but the difference from inbound, like I've had people come to me wanting my services and I think the main difference I think the inbound is an easier close, in my opinion, because with a personal brand like me and you have, if people see the credibility you have and you show that through your posts, through your whatever, whatever it may be, like it's a pretty easy close. Like it's not too hard. They know you can do it because they follow you and they and they've seen like if, even if they went through your website, you have case studies on your website. It's like, OK, this guy clearly knows what he's doing. It's right there in my face. Then you, they come to you, hey, my buddy wants this service, and then you get in contact. It's like, sweet, pay, pay, pay whatever, like whatever you're charging, right? They're like, sweet, let's do it. So in my in my personal experience, inbound's pretty, pretty, pretty easily, pretty easy yeah. to close. Yeah. And I, I love how you like I love how you <clears throat> are where you are by not liking sales because like the more that I get into sales, the more I'm, and especially in this like high ticket services and coaching space, the more I'm starting to realize like, dude, more of this, like it's less about sales ability and it's more about your offer. It's more about your results. Um, and maybe right. you've heard that before, but you can put like an absolutely terrible salesperson. Like let's say, um, I don't know, like think of like the Apple store. It's like you put the freaking high like the high school dropout, like just this dude who has nothing going, but he's gonna sell like iPhones like hotcakes, versus if you put like um if you if you put like a really, really good sales rep on a poor offer, like I don't know, they launched like something Blackberry. Phone, oh, it's Blackberry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like they're not gonna sell any of them. So right. I like that you exactly. like really nail it down to offer case studies, testimonials, and then just being able like, yes, you have to be competent on a sales call. Like, you can't be an idiot, right? right. But it, at that and point, you have, becomes- you're, you're solving a pain. And that's the main thing about like a discovery call, right? As you know, like you're, you're digging the pain, you're solving it. That's the way I think about sales. I'm pretty laid back. I don't really do scripts. I'm just like, Hey, we're figuring out a problem and we're going to see if I can fix it. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Like, am I the right that's doctor good. for your sickness? Essentially. <laughs> Yeah, once you have that, the offer dialed in in the case studies, like it becomes more about not messing up the call than like, like winning the call. Because like you, right. you already have the upper hand when you have that experience. Yep. Um, I want to ask you, like, for your for your agency and for the agency guys listening, like, have you found the most success with like the two call close model? Yep. Which exactly. we reaching yep. out to. A hundred percent. Just because. So for lead generation, it is very specific. Like if we can't, if someone doesn't have a proven offer, a proven case study, right? Like then we, it's going to be hard to help them. We can, but it's going to be hard. So the reason for that is because I always wanted, I was a big fan of one call closing just because I don't like wasting time, but continuously taking calls. I'm like, okay, I actually do have to take this discovery call just because I have to understand this company to see if I can actually help them and not screw them over and screw myself over at the same time. Um, because if I can help you, I, I'm going to be able to ask you questions and figure out if I really can. Right. So yeah, that's what we run and that's what we teach in agency velocity. So yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's like a hot topic right now. Like, Oh, the one call closed. I talked for 30 minutes and I collected five grand or whatever. Like there's, there's a time and a place for it. And if you try, there will be times where the two call close, can be a one call close but if it's not one of those times and you try to make it that like you could blow the deal you know and there are on the flip end of that like if you're running the one call close model and they genuinely need a second call and you don't allow them that like dude they could have bought but you blew the deal because you tried to push too hard you know it's about just reading the room and that's just sales yeah reading the room yep exactly yeah so let's see what, what's a, what's a good thing to cover. So I want to talk about, um, because a lot of the audience, I mean, my audience, they're like sales guys and 
the, the common progression is like get some cash flow in sales, learn the skill, and then go and build something, right? Um, in, in your program, do you see a lot of people come from like sales background and then they're like, Hey, I want to, I want to build something that's my own or like, what, what would your advice be for those people coming from yeah. that background? Yeah, yeah, yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. So we have a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds, sales included. Um, and I think like as a lead generation like agency and someone who owns that, I'd say sales is one of the most important skills to learn to learn in the beginning, right? Learn how to sell something, sell something, you'll make a lot of money. Um, but yeah, so people who have that sales experience and are looking to build something out, right? In my opinion, I don't think there's any specific thing you should do. I think it's really up to you because that's what my brother's doing right now. So I'll tell you a little bit about um, his story and it connects a lot to this. So my brother was a part of Closer Cartel. I'm sure you've heard of that. Um, and he was learning sales from that group. And it didn't like, it taught him a lot, but he didn't get like opportunities from it. So like, so to say, but he learned sales, he joined solar sales and he killed that and crushed that. But his main goal was like, okay, I'm going to learn this skill and I'm going to go build something on my own. And so he's in a spot right now where he's building up an agency of his own. And essentially is he used to be a barber and he's helping barbers launch like, um, basically get more clients, like just marketing for barbers. Right. And cool. he already has a client. He's been, do, he's been going on this. He's been working on this for like, I don't know, a month. Right. And he has that, that selling skill where it was easy. He hopped on the call, bang, bada boom, bada bang. He's been through it a thousand times. Right. So I think it's really up to you and what your desires are. Cause some people who are in probably in your community probably have backgrounds and other things. Like maybe it's yeah. something in like sports. Maybe they played football growing up or something, right? It's like, okay, now you can go sell football gear. Who knows? Like, is that really what, if that's where you, what you want to do? So I think it's up to the person. I don't think there's anything. Yeah. There's nothing holding them back. And it could be anything. It could be an agency. It could be <clears throat> whatever, right? I think it's it's ultimately up to them. So you can go sell anything yeah. now. So <laughs> Yeah, and then definitely like, one thing that I've, I mean, I've had the opportunity to do is like, if you are the sales piece, like just partner up with somebody who knows the other piece that, that you're missing, whether that's lead gen, whether that's operations backend, um, mm -hmm. you know, all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, honestly, like doing business with somebody else, it's just easier, bro. Like you can do more, you got too much, like as long as the person is somebody you want to do business with. Like it's two people to think things over, like two two sets of eyes, double the work. Yeah. Like it's exactly. I know you have people on your team now. I don't know, like I think you're like the main guy. Like you don't have a co-founder or anything, right? Mm -hmm. It's a lot. I'd say mis I'd say yeah, it's a lot. I'd say it's a mistake on my end. I personally, I'm not too focused on my agency right now. Everything kind of runs on itself, so I'm not necessarily looking for like a co-founder or like a, an extra mind. Um, but I think it's super, super beneficial. One, well, there's another, a lot of benefit, benefits, like you just said, but I think the, one of the benefits I see, main benefits I see in getting a co-founder is just how much workload you can actually take. So like right now, yeah. like our capacity, like we could probably get to like, like my team right now, we could probably get to like 10, 15, that's about max. Right. But with two minds or even more, you could get to a hundred. And what does that mean? That means more money, right? Yeah. So, yeah, hundred yeah. percent. You're you said you're not like your agency is kind of on autopilot. Are you? You're mostly focused on the coaching side of things. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Cool. What do you? Uh, I know you're a coach, but like, do you? Are you doing anything else for for agency velocity? So, for agency velocity, yeah. So I'm a coach slash consultant. I'm currently kind of transitioning to head of product. So everything that we have in the program, just making sure it's up to date, good, as best as we can get it. So right now that's what we're doing. I mean, that's what I'm doing. But yeah, so right now I'm focused on that. It's taking up a lot of my time, but it's a lot, a lot of fun. Um, and we've been killing it. Clients have been killing it. So yeah. 
Yeah. Cool. Cool. Well, we'll wrap it up here in a bit. I want to ask you though, like now that you know this skill of lead generation and you know how to, you know how to get by on sales calls and you know how to, you know, run a service. Like if everything, everything that you had done up to this point kind of got wiped out, except what, you know, like what, what would you, what would you do to, to restart? Would you do the same thing? Would you, would you do something else? I would a hundred percent do the same thing because two things that I know, and I've had, I've had, I had, I have experience in lead generation and sales. I've sold probably, I'm only 21 and I've sold probably, I don't know, uh, I would say around 40, 50 K in deals. Right. So it's pretty young. Um, but number one, number one thing I would do is definitely start outreach for myself. I would definitely do lead generation and I would hop on those sales calls and I'd be confident because number one, I have agency velocity where we're learning together and we're building together and we learn from each other. And so from there, I've been getting better at sales, even though I don't take a lot of sales calls. Right. So now if that even went away, I still have that content. So I take those sales calls and I'd probably have a higher, I'd probably have a higher close rate in my opinion. I think so. So hundred percent. That's what I would do is start a service-based business, hop on sales calls. I already know how to sell. I've done it, not hundreds, but probably around 50, 50, 60. Um, so yeah, so I'd be pretty confident in offering a service and selling it. So hundred oh, percent. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the cool thing about like what you and I do. Like you, you learn the skill of, of everything, you know, hit the fan tomorrow. You can just do it again. I can like, bounce back. I can, you can repeat, rinse and repeat. It's the same thing yeah. you've been doing. Right. Yeah. It, it definitely takes a different mind though, man, because a lot of people, you know, if that were to happen to them, if they're in like a job or something like, Oh, I lost my job. Like I'm done for, but like, I feel, and maybe Twitter is a uh, part of the reason because you're just opened up to so many more ideas and things. Um, right. But yeah, man, if you know like your value and what you can provide for a company, like it's it's not it's not the end of the world if you have to try again. Yeah. I mean it's the same thing with you, Dylan. Like if everything went away, dude, you know you could go hop on a good offer and sell it and make some good money. Yeah. Right? So that's the important importance of these skills that we're learning. Because I know a, like a lot about lead generation and a decent amount of sales, I'm confident I will not run out of money. <laughs> um, yeah. obviously if the internet went down today and but yeah obviously then but for a long time i'm <laughs> i'm pretty sure i'm not gonna run out of money i know how to like because i mean the number one thing is selling it if i didn't know how to sell it at all it'd be pretty hard i could probably still do it because it's a good offer but if you learn how to sell something a good product with a good offer you're not gonna run out of money if everything yeah. just like went down the drain today yeah and then if you lost all that, but you still had the network, like you and I oh, both have pretty, pretty solid networks. Like, dude, I, I always like, I'm in the same boat as you. It's like, if everything I had went to shit, but I still knew the people I knew within 48 hours, I'd have a sales job guaranteed. Boom. And it'd be a good one. So I'd say within, I would say within 24 hours, I would have a, I would have a, a call booked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a discovery call booked. <laughs> that's, that's a fast turnaround. Yeah, man. Well, um, let's, let's wrap it there. I think that was good. That was cool. Cool perspective. Yeah. Um, from, you know, not a natural sales guy, but someone who's had some success in sales and, and scaling a service based business. Um, I know you have a couple of offerings for the people. So let, let the people know where do they find you? Where do they work with you? Yeah. So you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, um, right now, I offer Agency Velocity, a consulting company where we help aspiring lead generation owners to scale to 10K per month in 92 days or less. Um, so that will be in the bio of my Twitter and my Instagram and on my YouTube videos. <clears throat> and also, I have a pretty cheap course, $3 course on how to start and scale a lead, gen lead generation agency. Only $3 has everything you need to start and scale a lead, gen lead generation agency. One of the best 
some of the best content I've ever released. So yeah, make sure to check those out. Sweet. Yeah. If you guys, I mean, a lot of, I've seen a lot of sales guys go into lead generation. If you're at that point where it's, you, you've got the cash flow and you're looking for the next thing. I mean, there's a lot of things out there, but like Wyatt said, lead generation is, it's not going away anytime soon. Unless the internet goes down, we're going to have bigger problems to deal with then, but <laughs> we'll wrap it up there. So I think episode 19 with Mr. Wyatt, I appreciate you coming on, man. Heck yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Dylan. Appreciate it so much.